News of the Times. Wicked Wednesdays. Two cases of killer Catherines. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at two cases where the protagonist is named Catherine. Our first case from 1850 Queen's County, Ireland, was quite a famous case in its day and exemplifies the limited position many a woman found herself in. Unhappily married and finding herself hounded by her drunken husband from whom she has separated, a skirmish ensues, ending in her husband's death. What made the case so remarkable was the inclusion of her mother being charged as an accessory in the murder. Our second case is from the hallowed halls of Oxford College in 1890, where Catherine, 33 years of age, and finding herself dumped by the junior dean of the college with whom she has been in relations for two years, does not take the rejection well. Poison pen letters begin to appear around the college. The situation escalates when the engagement of her former lover is announced. Catherine purchases a pistol and begins to stalk staff at Oxford. Two Cases of Murderous Catherines is today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. Case 1. Catherine Moore, Queen's County, Ireland, 1850. This case, with the charge against Catherine for murder and her mother as an accessory, after the fact, gripped the news in the area at the time. The story is a sad one. Catherine, who is clearly in a marriage that is damaging to her and that she states she never wanted, attempts to make her escape by leaving him and moving back to her mother. Her mother sells all their possessions, leaves and travels to America, but returns a few weeks later, penniless and demanding some support from his beleaguered wife. From the Mayo Constitution, the 26th of March, 1850, Assizes Intelligence, Queen's County. Catherine Moore, an extremely fine young woman, and Elizabeth Moore, her mother, were placed at the bar, the former charged with the willful murder of her husband, Patrick Moore, on the 27th of August last, at Turo, in this county, and the mother, Elizabeth Moore, was charged as an accessory after the fact. Owen Moore, brother of the prisoner Catherine, examined, states he heard his mother and sister say that his sister Catherine had taken the ass and went towards Clongerman Bog with the body of her husband, Patrick Moore, whom she had killed. About two hours after that, witness saw his sister returning with the ass and car. Witness called her a murderess. She said in reply, it was no harm, and said if he spoke of it, she would get his mother to beat him. He heard Catherine tell his mother and sister Biddy that she had put her husband's body in a hole by the side of a ditch near Clongerman. He states he saw blood on the ass's car, which his mother washed off. Early on the morning of Monday the 27th, witness heard his sister Catherine call his mother, who went out with her. His mother and sister afterwards told witness that they removed the body from Murray's garden to their own garden, where they covered it with rushes at the back of the summer house. Catherine's testament. The Crown produced as evidence the statement from the prisoner Catherine, which was as follows. She was desired by her husband Saturday night, the 26th of August, to meet him and bring him some whiskey with her. She met him in a field adjoining her house. She brought the whiskey with her and he drank. 
They had a difference about something he wanted to do, and which she prevented. When he got enraged, and took a large knife out of his pocket, and attempted to stab her, she resisted, and in wrestling and wrenching the knife came across his throat. She felt the warm blood as they rolled together towards a deep dike of a ditch. He shouted, and she, being afraid of her mother, put her hand on his mouth. He puffed and snorted, but she held her hand on him until he ceased to move, and she then left At about midday on Monday, she got him into her mother's ass car, carried him, and tied his hands with a cord. She then drove to the bog road and pitched the body into a small hole. She tied his coat about his head and face and covered him over with bog. She set off to her brother in Dundalk, who gave her seven guineas and then went to Liverpool on her way to America. When she got a letter from her brother Pat desiring her to come home, she came back and found that her mother and sisters had been taken, and she said at once that she was guilty and that God would free the innocent. She went to bed, and the sergeant of police came the morning at seven o'clock and took her prison. More witnesses are brought forward to attest to the finding of his body and to corroborate Catherine's statement. Catherine Murphy was then examined. She and her son Michael were at the bog Wednesday, the 26th of September last, when her son called out that there was a dead man in the bog hole. Witness was then about ten yards from the spot. She came over to where her son pointed and saw a man's foot with a stocking on it. His toes were through the stocking. His head was sunk in the bog hole. Better than half the man was over the water. Part of the leg and thighs were eaten as if by dog. She then went and alarmed the neighbourhood and sent her son for the police. Elizabeth Moore, sister of Catherine, examined. Her mother told her that Catherine had awoke her out of bed at daylight and told her that Catherine had killed her husband. Their mother then brought her out and showed her his body lying at the back of the summer house in the garden. He was without a hat, and his head and neck were lying against the ditch. His clothes were on, and he was covered with rushes. The clothes could be seen through the rushes. She saw his throat had been cut, and the blood was about his neck, bosom, and waistcoat. Her mother told her it was in his own garden, and about two, three perches from the summer house he was killed in, and that she helped Catherine bring the body from that place to the summer house. After that, Catherine came in. She asked her sister, Catherine, what made her do it? Catherine said it was neck or nothing with her, that he pulled out a knife and thought to kill her. He thought to stab her in the neck, and she turned and cut him in the neck. Witness then said she would go for the police and get her taken, and that she would get her hung. Her mother said they would all be taken if witness did so, so they would say they all helped her. This closed the evidence. The Lord Chief Justice, having delivered a clear and able charge, the jury retired, and in about one hour returned in court with a verdict of guilty against both prisoners. His lordship proceeded to place the black cap on his head and pronounce sentence of death on the prisoner Catherine and of transportation for life on the mother as an accessory. The scene at this moment was truly distressing. The prisoner Catherine swooned off, having been placed at the bar to hear her sentence. Catherine 
with her guilty verdict, is most concerned what will become of her mother in her transportation to life. Although accepting her fate, in prison she gives the matrons more details as to the actual events. It places Catherine in a situation that was all too common for many like her at the time. From the Morning Herald, the 15th of April, 1850, the execution of Catherine Moore. Although no public confession was made on the scaffold or attested declaration in the cell, we have learned that the unhappy woman's version of the tragedy was not without some mitigating circumstances, which, if they had been advanced at her trial and sustained by evidence, might have saved her from a felon's death. Her verbal statement of the untoward event and its antecedents, even during the current month, was thus. She was married to the late Patrick Moore, much against her inclination, and that the marriage was an unhappy one. In consequence of ill treatment, which she experienced from her husband's friends, in addition to matters of a more private nature, she was compelled to return to her mother's residence for shelter. Her husband, having sold off his crop and everything else he could dispose of, left the place, and it was rumoured that he went to America. After an absence of about six or seven weeks, he returned penniless. He had not then a house to live in, and he had to reside with some of his friends. On the Friday morning previous to the fatal occurrence, a girl named Mary Brennan brought a message from him, which was to the effect that he wanted some money to procure whiskey and to get his shoes mended, and she also added that he wanted to see her. In order to meet his demands, she pawned her clothes. On the following Saturday, her mother sent for a cloak to a neighbour's house. At this place, she met Julia King, who told her that her husband was anxious to see her. She desired her to tell him that he could meet her at the end of her mother's garden on the evening of the following Sunday. Having got money from her mother to buy bread, she kept a sixpence out of it for which she had bought a half pint of whiskey for her husband, as he had sent her word that he was sick and wanted to cure him, he having been up two nights to wait. She then sent word to him to meet her. When they met, he drank the whiskey up in one draught, and then commenced upbraiding her with keeping company and being intimate with other men. Some strong and angry words were interchanged. He then got into a furious passion and caught her in his arms. She asked him what he was going to do. His reply was that either of them should go to the devil, that they could not be tormenting one another any longer. He then dragged her towards a ditch and flung her into a heap of briars. He next pulled out a pocket knife which he was in the habit of carrying, and attempted to stab her. She seized a hold of his hand, and in doing so, the knife cut her. A struggle ensued. In resisting the plunges of the knife, she turned it towards his throat, where a gash was inflicted. They still struggled, and when she eventually succeeded in wringing the knife from him, and in the excitement of the moment she thrust it into his breast or neck. She then flung away the fatal weapon, and her husband at the same time fell into the ditch. He began to roar out, and the dogs commenced to bark. She then got afraid of an alarm being made, and she kept her hand upon his mouth to stifle his voice. After some time she left him and went in to her mother, who, observing her torn by the thorns 
and cut, questioned her as to what had happened. She told her a portion of what had occurred. Early the next morning she went out to the end of the garden, the scene of the previous night's occurrence, where she found her husband dead. Catherine's execution Thursday the 11th instant being the day appointed for the execution of Catherine Moore for the murder of her husband, nearly a thousand persons assembled at the front of the jail at Maryborough. The Leinster Express, after detailing the usual preliminaries on such occasions, goes on to say the culprit had been an exceedingly pretty woman and never in her life did she appear so interesting as when she moved along, robed in the sable vestments of death. Her eye was intensely bright. Her regular and still beautiful features were flushed. Her step elastic. Her tone of voice clear, distinct and confident. On ascending the narrow stairs which led to the drop, she betrayed the first symptoms of weakness. Only one could ascend at a time, and her progress was impeded by her flowing garments. While her drapery was being arranged, she burst into tears and asked the Reverend Mr. Murray if he could not try and do something for her poor, afflicted mother. Having reached the landing place, she was conducted to the open press room, where, after some moments spent in prayer, she passively submitted to the operation of pinioning. During this process, she became faintish and desired the executioner not to take her short. She soon rallied and, supported by the two clergymen, mounted to the drop, still audibly beseeching God for mercy and forgiveness. And while on the drop, she again mentioned the name of her mother in a voice of yearning solicitude. After hanging the prescribed period, the body was removed and placed in a shell for burial within the precincts of the prison. It was expected that there would be a dying declaration, but there was no public confession of guilt or declaration of innocence. We have been informed that her conversation and demeanour from a short period after her sentence until the hour of execution was most satisfactory and edifying. Postscript. Catherine's mother does not survive her interment, waiting for transportation, and dies shortly after her daughter is executed. From the Dublin Evening Mail, 20th of May, 1850. Bridget Thompson, mother of Catherine Moore, who was executed last month for the murder of her husband, died of fever on Saturday in the jail at Maryborough. She had been sentenced to transportation for life as an accessory after the fact. Case 2. Catherine Reardon, Oxford, 1890. Catherine Reardon, also known as Kate, had been having a relationship with the junior dean of the college, Thomas Haynes. The relationship of some two years was ended by Haynes, and he then became engaged with Miss Bright, the daughter of a fellow colleague at Oxford University. Haynes reportedly had given a gift to Catherine of some fifty pounds at the time of their breakup, worth approximately eight thousand pounds in 2024. Here the story diverges. Catherine states that there was an understanding between them and that Haynes and her were to marry. Haynes stated that he had been most clear with Catherine that the relationship was over. Catherine, at age 33, would most likely have found it difficult to hope for any other viable marriage prospects. The engagement between Haynes and the young Miss Bright is announced, and Catherine goes into a fury. It starts with poison pen letters that are sent to Haynes and various colleagues. 
It moves onto letters to Dr. Bright threatening to kill the whole of his family. In a letter to Haynes, she threatens suicide. Catherine purchases a revolver, and it would seem that she spent some time stalking various members of the college until she had her chance that fateful day in November when, unable to see Mr. Haynes, she shoots instead Dr. Bright, father of the engaged Miss Bright. From the Sheffield Evening Telegraph, the 8th of November, 1890, the outrage at Oxford. The woman, Kate Reardon, aged 35, arrived at Oxford Railway Station in charge of Superintendent Head and Inspector Dixon. Shortly after 11 o'clock last night, she was at, at once placed in a cab and driven to the police station. The porter at the lodge of University College came forward and identified the prisoner who, after being formally charged with shooting Dr. Bright, was lodged in the cell. The citizens are still ex exercised about the escape of the doctor's assailant and the ease with which she got away, but it has transpired that Mr. Weller, finding that his master had been shot by a woman, ran out and made his way to the railway station fast as he could. He failed to find the woman. The police did not receive information of the occurrence until a long time after the woman had left Oxford, but as soon as they heard of it, they telegraphed her description in all directions, and detectives were at both Reading and Paddington stations to meet the woman, but they did not find her. Kate Reardon, on being arrested at Brompton, denied the charge and said that although she had been in Oxford, she was not, not there on Thursday. The following is the entry on the police charge sheet. Catherine Teresa Reardon, 3A, Sydney Street, Fulham Road, no occupation, charged with attempting to willfully murder James Bright at his residence at University College by shooting him with a revolver between 5 and 6 p.m. on Thursday. The accused was accommodated with a bed in Inspector Dixon's office, and the wife of one of the police officials attended requirements. She complained today of a bad headache, but otherwise said little. At the Oxford Police Court this morning, before the mayor, Catherine Theresa Reardon was charged with attempting to murder Dr. Bright at the University College in Oxford on Thursday. In reply to the charge, the prisoner said, I'm perfectly innocent. She was attired in a grey dress, dark hat, with violet flowers, and wore a fur boa. She was very pale. William Tomlin, porter at the lodge, deposed that on Thursday he was having his tea when a person whom he took to be the prisoner came in and asked for Mr. Haynes the junior dean. He showed her the way to the rooms, and she went up, but came back and stood by the lodge. She saw Mr. Haynes afterwards, and the latter said he wished her to leave the college. She said she would not leave the place, and that she would stay there all night. Witness then went into the room where the prisoner was sitting, and said that if she did not leave, he would be obliged to turn her out. He followed her down the stairs, and she said that if there was no one to take her in charge, she would leave. Witness again saw the person who he was quite certain was the prisoner, and she said to him, You are on the alert. Subsequently, he heard of the affair at the master. Mr. Weller, the butler to Dr. Bright, deposed that at about quarter or half past four on Thursday, the accused called and asked to see Miss Wickham or Miss Bright, but the request was denied her, and Dr. Bright then, coming downstairs, she left by the front door. She returned later, and Dr. Bright said, What is it? Dr. Bright went downstairs, and the witness afterwards heard a report of a revolver, and the master said, 
go for that woman. Witness ran through the streets, but did not find her. Mr. Haynes, the junior dean, deposed that he was passing the master's house and heard voices from the library. The master said, you must go and get a policeman, he said. He would. He saw no more until he was told of the attempted murder. He was quite positive the prisoner was the woman. This was all the evidence taken, and prisoner in reply to the question of the mayor again said that she was perfectly innocent. The mayor then said she would be remanded until Tuesday. The accused was taken back to Inspector Dixon's office, whence she will be conveyed to the county jail. The case is an embarrassment to the university and to the Haynes family. No one clearly understands why Catherine had shot Dr. Bright. Catherine herself is quiet and stated to be unwell. As more evidence is gathered, it begins to become clear to others that the impetus of her actions was her perception of having been mistreated as she states that she and Haynes had an agreement to wed. From the St. James's Gazette, the 10th of November, 1890. The Oxford shooting case. The prisoner before the Vice-Chancellor. Catherine Reardon was this morning brought before Vice-Chancellor of Oxford University and charged with attempting to murder Dr. Bright of University College. The prisoner looked very ill and had been in the prison infirmary since Sunday. Great excitement prevailed in the court, which was crowded with persons interested in the case, including many dons. Mr. T. Mallam prosecuted and Mr. H. Fuller defended the prison. Mr. John Thomas Augustus Haynes, a fellow and tutor of University College, said that on Thursday afternoon he saw the prisoner at Dr. Bright's residence. Dr. Bright said, Here is the woman. He said, Why are you holding a dagger over me? You promised me marriage, and I have a marriage certificate. In cross-examination, the witness, Mr. Haynes, said, It was quite untrue that he had promised marriage or was married to the prisoner. He identified the letters produced as being in the prisoner's handwriting. One letter informed him that he was quite safe, but that she would murder every member of Dr. Bright's family. The prisoner sent him a written statement in which she said that she had purchased a revolver in Pall Mall three months ago, giving the name of Wickham. Also, that she came to Oxford on Thursday to acknowledge the wrongs she had done him, but on Dr. Bright's sending for a policeman, he fired to frighten. The case is proceeding, and Dr. Bright passed a good night and is going on well. As police continue to investigate, the poison pen mystery that had been taking place for some time to various members of the staff at Oxford also becomes clear. From the Daily Telegraph and Courier in London, 10th of November 1890, the Oxford outrage romantic details examination of the accused. The excitement in Oxford still continues to spread with regard to the singular attack on Dr. Bright at University College. Various rumours are afloat as to the supposed motives of the crime. Slowly, however, the facts are shaping themselves into a more or less consistent story. And although there are certain points which are mysterious, or at all events ambiguous in their import, the main outlines are tolerably clear. It appears that for some time past, anonymous letters have been, been received by various persons at the university and city, according to one report even by the Dean of Christ Church himself. These letters, one of which was sent to the barmaid of the mitre, invariably contained some dark hints of what the writer described according to her own mode of spelling as the Oxford scandal. A scandal which concerned some particular person or persons 
in authority in one of the colleges on which the anonymous sender had determined to have sifted and, if need be, avenged. The missives were literate and had various signatures, but the purport was invariably the same, and in one of them the address of the writer was incautiously divulged. It needs scarcely to be added that the person or persons with whom some kind of acquaintance was claimed by the sender of the letters was specified by name. It has already been mentioned that the address of the anonymous letter writer was known to the police which accounts for the fact that they were at once able to telegraph to London to have the house 35 Sydney Street, Fulham Road, watched during the night. The lady, however, who is suspected of the attack, is supposed to have caught the 5.40pm train from Oxford, and she certainly reached her house without molestation. On Friday morning, Superintendent Head with Inspector Dixon, Dr. Bright's butler, left by the 12 o'clock train for Paddington and drove at once to the house in Sydney Street, which had been also already mentioned. Both the landlady and the maid declared that their lodger, Miss Catherine Theresa Riordan, who, however, sometimes called herself Catherine O'Hara, had not left the house for some days and that she was ill in bed. When confronted by the police and Dr. Bright's butler, the lady in question at first denied all knowledge of Oxford. Subsequently, however, she mentioned the names of Mr. Haynes and Miss Bright, and being properly identified by the butler as the visitor at Dr. Bright's house, was arrested and brought down to Oxford on Friday evening. On Saturday morning, she was brought before the mayor Mr. Alderman, and having been formally identified by the porter at University College, the butler of Dr. Bright, and Mr. Haynes himself, was remanded for trial on the charge of shooting at Dr. Bright with an attempt to murder. For some time past, has has already been stated, letters had been received at Oxford mentioning Mr. Haynes and Miss Bright by name, and threatening vengeance. The story which they contained, which may be taken for whatever it is worth, is that Mr. Haynes had promised marriage elsewhere, and in one letter that he was already a married man. These statements Mr. Haynes has emphatically contradicted, as mentioned in our Saturday's issue. The prisoner, Miss Reardon, is a woman of about 30 or 35 years, ladylike in her appearance and well built. When she appeared before the mayor on Saturday, she looked deadly pale, with a strange light in her eyes, which certainly betokened great nervous excitement, although in manner she was composed. She declares herself to be innocent of the crime with which she is charged. If we assume that the sender of the letters and Miss Reardon are one of the same person, the natural inference is that she was too weighted by a violent jealousy, that she had come down to Oxford determined to do something desperate, and that, as she could see neither Miss Bright nor Mr Haynes alone, she turned her vengeance against the father of the engaged lady. If the other supposition be correct, and the assailant of Dr. Bright was either temporarily or normally off her mental balance, it is of course useless to look for any motive for the act of a mad. Meanwhile, it is satisfactory to know that the master of University College is on the high road to recovery. He has had a very narrow escape, but as matters stand, he is pretty well out of danger. It is said that there had been no instances at all events within recent years of a charge so grave in character as that affecting Miss Reardon being brought before the Vice-Chancellor, and as a rule the cases are more or less trivial, 
dealing either with rowdyism on the part of undergraduates in the streets or with disputes between the students and shopkeepers on the subject of debt. As for Miss Reardon, she was at once conveyed in a cab to the police station in the High Street, and as the hour was so late, the crowds of persons who had been waiting about in expectation of seeing her had almost dispersed, and only about a score of men and boys followed the cab. The prisoner was not put into a cell, what was provided with a bed in the quarters of a married constable. She is a good-looking person, and gave but little indication of being the insane young woman that she has been described to be. She conversed freely and rationally when asked of the incidents connecting with her to arrest, and although she has asserted that she was not out of London on Thursday, she was positively identified by Mr. Haynes, the sub-dean of University College, by Dr. Bright's butler, and by the college porter. Witness after witness is called, confirming her presence on the campus, and of her having been the person who clearly shot at Dr. Bright. Her defence states that she is suffering from mental instability, but no medical evidence is produced confirming this diagnosis. Dr. Bright is confirmed as improving, but he is unable medically to testify. Catherine, with the waves of witnesses who have seen her shoot Dr. Bright, throws herself on the mercy of the court during the inquest. From the Manchester Courier, the 11th of November, 1890, the Oxford shooting case, committal of the accused confession. Mr. Malham here handed a document to Mr. Haynes, the body of which witness said was not the prisoner's handwriting, but certain of the words were. Mr. Malham read the document, the substance of which was, To Mr. Haynes, I am guilty of writing letters to Dr. Bright and Mr. Haynes for which I am very sorry. I did it at a time when I was not responsible for my actions. I bought a revolver in Pall Mall two months ago. I came to Oxford and I fired a shot at Dr. Bright. I wished to see Mr. Haynes to tell him how sorry I was for the wrong I had done him. I fired not for the purpose of harming Dr. Bright, but only to frighten him. I had no motive and I am very sorry if I have harmed Mr. Haynes or Dr. Bright. I have been very ill for two months. I can only throw myself upon the mercy of the court. I am very sorry for what I have done. I do not wish to be defended, but leave myself to their mercy, Catherine Reardon. The signature, said witness, was in the handwriting of the prisoner. From the confession that Catherine has made, some of the poison pen letters that had been received are also read out in court. Mr. Mallam then read the letter received by witness. It contained the following passages. If Dr. Bright thinks he can get his daughter married without a scandal, he has made a grand mistake. Haynes is a married man, though Bright may not believe it. There occurred a passage setting forth a horrible charge against Dr. Bright. Another letter states, Dr. Bright and his family don't ride out now because they are afraid of a shot. Don't be surprised if you see seven coffins turned out of University College in a few days. The people of Oxford will have another Hampstead murder, only there will be two. The letter also referred to another person in Oxford mentioned in the course of the case. The written confession attested by Emma Jordan, matron of Her Majesty's prison in Oxford, was put in and sworn to. The charge was then formally read over to the prisoner by the Vice-Chancellor, Mr. Fuller, on behalf of the prisoner, replied, I say nothing and I reserve my defence. The depositions of the several witnesses were then read over. 
and the several letters and documents marked for reference. The enclosure to the barmaid of the mitre, it transpired, were certain verses of doggerel of filthy description. The vice-chancellor then committed prisoner for trial at the ensuing assizes opening on Friday on a charge of the attempted murder of Dr. James Frank Bright by shooting him with a revolver. Police continue to investigate in anticipation of the court case to come. Some of the mysteries, such as what had happened to Catherine's wet clothes, and why were police informed that she had been in her room three days during the shooting, are now explained. From the Portsmouth Evening News, the 13th of November, 1890. The Oxford shooting case. Information has reached Oxford that Inspector and Sergeant Church of the Metropolitan Police had made a further search of Catherine Reardon's rooms, with the result that one or two points about which there was some mystery have now been cleared up. It will be remembered that on Thursday night, when the attempted murder took place, the streets were very muddy, and the Oxford police, when they arrested the woman, naturally expected to find her clothing, would show some signs of her journey through the streets. This, however, they failed to do. The London police, however, in making their further search, found a black dress and jacket hanging behind the bedroom door, which were not there when Superintendent Head arrested the prisoner. The landlady, Mrs. Oakfield, on being questioned as to where they were at the time, said she found them in the passage on Thursday night dirty and had them brushed. Elizabeth Wright, the servant, now states that Miss Reardon asked her on Friday morning to say if anyone called for her that she'd been in bed for three days and that she took her tea to her room at half past four on Thursday. She is charged with attempted murder, but although there is no medical evidence of diminished responsibility, the judge and the jury seem to be sympathetic, and Catherine is convicted of wounding with intent a lesser crime than the original charge of attempted murder. From the Bridlington and Key Gazette, the 22nd of November, 1890, the Oxford shooting case, trial and sentence. At the Oxford Assizes on Monday, Catherine Theresa Reardon, 35, of Sydney Street, Fulham Road, London, was charged with the attempted murder of Dr. Frank Bright on the 16th inst. The prisoner, who looked in better health than at the preliminary, pleaded not guilty in a firm voice. The jury found prisoner guilty of wounding with intent to do grievous bodily harm. Justice Matthew sentenced her to six years penal servitude. The sentence was received with hisses in court, a demonstration which the judge severely commented on. A request is made for mitigation of her sentence based on Catherine not being accountable for her actions at the time of the offence. But... The request is denied by the Home Secretary. Catherine is sent to the Naphill female convict prison in Woking, where she completes her six years. Dr. Bright recovered and passed in 1920. He was 88 years of age. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, two cases of killer Catherine. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful where we look at crimes in a location such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, 
where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun with a unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. If you like this channel, you may be interested in our sister channel, Chronicle of the Times, where we offer a lighter side of Victorian and Edwardian news stories, as well as a weekly podcast of stories from authors of the day, such as Dickens, Collins, Benson and Conan Doyle. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.